underachievers. I'm an underachiever too. We're just gonna own it tonight. There's no shame in, in being a fuck up. And you know, it's a hard world out there. And chances are, in your life as an underachiever, you find yourself asking, what if you were as easy to hypnotize as a dolphin? Okay, so bear me out here. First of all, you might or might not know that dolphins are the easiest of the animal kingdom to, to hypnotize. Like, pretty much all you need is an oscillating series of tones underwater, plus like an inflatable seahorse in like a gently undulating motion. And you can pretty much make it a dolphin and believe anything. Like, you can hypnotize a dolphin to think it's a chicken, and you can also hypnotize a chicken to believe it's a dolphin, and then you have, like, ultimate power over creation. And this one time, actually, I hypnotized a goat to think it was a horse, and I rode it to victory in this really, really, really steep steeplechase, and that's why they call me Goat Rider. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, anyway, so what if you were as easy to hypnotize as a dolphin? You might think this is impossible, but it's not, because science has found the way. And tonight we're going to show you how, so that you can all be entrepreneurs. Okay, because as you probably know, the opposite of entrepreneurship is education. Right? The more education you have, the less you can create wealth. smarts just gets in the way of the raw instinct, the killer drive, the monetization. And so you need to get at the inner sort of dolphin brain in order to look around the room and see everybody here is either a customer or an employee or maybe a custody or I don't know, somebody who's also both or whatever. But in order to monetize everything, you need to, to get into that kind of killer dolphin mindset. So we're gonna be doing a series of exercises tonight that's going to get you into a state of dolphinosis, basically. <laughs> what, we, what we in the business call dolphinosis. And you know, basically step one is just imagine that you are floating in the ocean and the ocean is made of money. And to lead us through step two, actually, we're going to bring up Rachel Swirsky, who is um, an expert on dolphinosis. Um, and she is also an amazing, amazing writer. Her short fiction has appeared in Tor.com, Pank, The Conundrum Engine Literary Review, The New Haven Review, Weird Tales, Fantasy Magazine, many, many others. It's been in a ton of year's best anthologies. Um, her novella, The Lady Who Plucked Red Flowers Beneath the Queen's Window, won the 2010 Nebula Award. And is also nominated for the Hugo World Fantasy Awards. Um, she has, I believe, a novelette up for the Hugo and Nebula Awards this year, uh, called Fields of Gold, and we're all rooting for her. And, um, you know, and actually, it's interesting, before she was a famous uh, fantasy and science fiction writer, um, Rachel Swirsky actually grew up in a highly advanced civilization, super advanced, where their technology had long, long, long since become indistinguishable from magic, as, you know, you all know, will happen. And, um... So she actually had a super lucrative job going around distinguishing, distinguishing between technology and magic. <laughs> she would come to your house and you'd show her all your stuff and she'd be like, okay, magic, magic, technology, technology, magic, 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 magic. And people would pay her a fortune to figure out what of their shit was like technology and what was magic. And she had her own TV show for all. It was like an antique roadshow, except for distinguishing between technology and magic. And it was huge. She was super famous, and like people would try to stump her. They would blindfold her and bring her like a shape-changing potion and a bunch of like biomimetic blobs, and she would just be like, "Nope, magic technology." But, you know, people would do all sorts of crazy shit, like you know, make things disappear using nanotech or cause babies to sprout wings and fly away. Which this was before babies were just started started always sprouting wings, which happened later. But back then, it was still a new thing. And she, you could not fool her. She was completely, like, she was, she had, like, an uncanny, like, unerring knack for distinguishing. And this went on for years, and she became, like, you know, a huge, huge, huge celebrity in her civilization. And then she started hearing reports of this item, this, this weird object called the orb with three O's, that basically was both technology and magic, and you know, completely erased the magic technology dichotomy, and it was like something that would just, she would hear all these strange stories about its amazing properties and all the ways that it could change the universe, and um, 
you know, she was like really freaked out by this because this could put her out of business. The orb was like, you know, it was like this kind of Loch Ness monster of, of artifacts. And she would, she started just getting more and more obsessed with it. And she would go out at night and go to the markets and ask everybody about it. And she read everything there was on, online about it. She read all the books. She spent like just days locked inside and nights wandering around trying to find out everything there was to know about the orb, but, but nobody could tell her all the details and she started amassing little hints here and there about what it was and what it could do and how it could, you know, completely revolutionize everything. And finally she just she got so obsessed that she started putting together schematics of what would it look like and what could it do and you know how would it actually work and how could it be both and neither and what, what would it, what an object that erases the magic technology to how to even be like? And finally, before she knew it, like she stayed up 36 hours straight, and when she stopped, she had built the orb herself. And she was actually the first person ever to build it. It didn't exist until she created it. And either it had like, sent its legend back in time somehow, or it had only been a myth until now, but she had actually created it, and she became even more famous. And it just, but it started just erasing all dichotomies everywhere, any dichotomy between, you know, logic and intuition, or motorcycles and bicycles. There was no, the, there was no longer any distinction between the two. And wherever she went with the orb, dichotomies were just completely erased, and people were excited, but also kind of terrified, and it just destabilized her society, and her whole society became completely organized around the, or maybe even organized around the orb, and she finally had to flee because, sorry, and she finally had to flee and, and come to a less advanced society, and she was like, the only way I can atone for this is by bringing the orb to like a society that has not yet discovered advanced technology and doesn't really understand magic, and I'll just show up with the orb and pretend it's completely magical, and I'll become the greatest sorcerer this world has ever known, and A, I'll be like rich and famous, and B, I will have restored the magic science dichotomy. And so she came to Earth with the orb, but unfortunately, as soon as she got here, it like was out of commission and ran out of power, and it hasn't worked since. So her plans were completely derailed, but every time she comes and tells weird stories to a group of people, the orb regains one part of its functionality. And so by being here and listening to her tonight, you are contributing to your eventual enslavement. I mean, um, you know, your eventual uh, admiration of Rachel Swirsky. So please give her a, a down payment on that and give it up for Rachel Swirsky.